Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon from Nairobi. Uh, that's great. And Cape Town, Jobek, good afternoon. Good afternoon from Cape Town. Okay, thank you. I am using Swiss time here, so I was waiting exactly for 2 o'clock. And uh, let me just start by bringing your attention to the subject of our webinar today. Our webinar today is on resourcing resilience, the case for social protection for adherence and HIV-related outcomes in children and adolescents in Eastern and Southern Africa. That is the topic which we will be discussing today. And uh, let me just again take another minute to introduce the regional interagency task team on children and AIDS in Eastern and Southern Africa, which we refer to in short as RIAT. Now, RIAT is basically a network of 40 organizations in Eastern and Southern Africa, which are brought together by a common desire to make sure that children issues in HIV and AIDS response are prioritized. Now, as a network, RIAT focuses on three core competencies or three priority areas. They seek to improve issues of care and support for children, and they want to use the tool of advocacy and social protection. And if you are interested in knowing more about RIAT, I would refer you to their website, which is up to date. I've had a chance to really go on it, and it's up to date. You will enjoy it. And before I ask the presenters to actually start, I would just want to draw you to a function or to how this whole process of the webinar works. You will realize that on the right-hand side of your screen, there is a section which appears there for comments and questions. Now, every time you have a comment, every time you have a question to make, just type it in that box and send it. And the people who are helping us facilitate this, they will put all these questions together and share with us. So look closely also on that box on the right. Now, in terms of how the meeting is going to roll today, we are going to review a report which has been done on resourcing resilience. And this report is going to be presented to us by Leslie Gittings and Ilona Tosca. They are both from the AIDS and Society Research Unit, which is based at Cape Town University. And I am going to ask Leslie and Ilona to just briefly introduce themselves before they get into the presentation. And when Leslie and Gittings are complete, we are going to have Dr. Nongo from the African Platform for Social Protection also doing his presentation. It's, it's like a response to what would have been presented initially. And we will have a slot for panelists to ask questions. And to, this will be a time for everybody who is on this webinar to actually be heard. And then after that, we will have some discussion and some closing remarks, which we will make from here. So right now, I would like to ask Leslie and Ilona to introduce themselves and to go straight into the subject of the day where they are going to present on the topic which I just mentioned. Thank you. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today um, with my colleague, Alona Tosca, um, to present the report on resourcing resilience, uh, the case for social protection for adherence and HIV-related outcomes for children and adolescents in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, and we'll be presenting uh, this report, but it was actually written uh, collaboratively by um, the other people who you'll see shortly on the screen. Um, and also informed largely by uh, participants. So 
So my name is Leslie Giddings. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Cape Town uh, School of Public Health and AIDS and Society Research Unit, as well as a co-investigator on Mzansi Wako, which is a research project on ART adherence, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. Thank you, Leslie. Hello, everyone. My name is Elana Tosca, and I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford and Cape Town, and I'm working on the sexual and reproductive health of HIV-positive adolescents and also a part of the Mzansi Wako study. So uh, this report was uh, conceptualized by RIAT, and what we were really looking to do is answer a few key questions. Uh, we wanted to understand what is the evidence on effectiveness of social protection for adherence to ART and other HIV-related outcomes for children as well as adolescents in Eastern and Southern Africa. We also wanted to understand what are the key challenges to implementing child and adolescent sensitive social protection programs. And last, we were really looking to understand what are the critical research gaps um, in this field, specifically around social protection, adherence, and HIV outcomes. So the context in which um, we are working and where this research was conducted is one where AIDS is the, or AIDS-related illness is the leading cause of death among adolescents. Um, and it's also the second leading cause of death of adolescents worldwide. Um, structural deprivations are key factors um, for child and adolescent um, ART adherence and loss to follow-up. And um, social protection is one mechanism that might address some of these complex vulnerabilities, risks and disadvantages, as well as foster resilience. So in defining um, uh, child and adolescent sensitive social protection, we took uh, definitions from our, our colleagues um, who have already done this work very well, um, including the IDS, um, who defines uh, social protection as a set of public and private policies and programs that are aimed at preventing, reducing, and eliminating economic and social vulnerabilities to poverty and deprivation. Uh, for the child-sensitive component, we also took the UNICEF de definition, um, which looks to address the inherent social disadvantages, risks, and vulnerabilities that children may be born into, as well as those that they might acquire later in childhood. So, to answer the three research questions that Leslie um, introduced at the beginning, we combined a few different research methods, and we'll not go into detail into these, but we'll be happy to answer questions. However, the, the different arms of, of the, of co that contributed to the report include a, a rigorous review of academic policy and any other publications on child-sensitive social protection in, in the region, consultations with 27 experts from national, regional, and um, international institutions, some of whom um, May, may be in, in the webinar at the moment, and we thank you for, for being a part of this, and also in-depth interviews with local providers and, and stakeholders in the Eastern Cape, where the Mzanziwako study is set up to truly understand how people who are both delivering and, and at, the, at the forefront of these uh, social protection provisions experience them. The Mzanziwako study itself includes multiple methodologies. We've interviewed over 1,500 adolescents, um, 1,060 of whom my HIV positive. In parallel, um, a qualitative study has used ethnography, focus group discussions, body mapping, multiple methodologies to work with um, 150 adolescents, caregivers, and providers. And as part of this report, um, Leslie led a participatory research with 39 adolescents that focused specifically on social protection provisions. And to guide our work, we, we kind of tried to set up a structural, a conceptual framework to help us understand how different kinds of social protection can lead to long-term um, health, improved health outcomes. And we really had a lot of amazing work from colleagues to work with. So we adapted UNICEF's conceptual framework on social cash transfers, which really takes a socio-ecological approach to resilience, which means you really have to take into account factors at different levels of a child's well-being, at the individual level, at the community level, obviously um, at the family level, and then also in a more structural um, access to services level. But really our, our main contribution is on the left-hand side of this slide where we put our heads together with the different um, stakeholders and our colleagues to think about what different kinds of social protection provisions are really key in in the older children's and adolescents' lives. And you all know of social cash transfers and cash in kind, which include grants and pensions, and um, who are, which are more traditional, but also slightly less conventional um, social protection provisions, such as food, um, meals at school, free school uniforms. And then the second type includes care social protection provisions, such as 
home-based care, better parenting um, support, um, social support, peer support, etc. And a third type that emerged from our research that we really wanted to um, get a better understanding, but uh, we know that it's really just the beginning of this sort of research, it's this idea of capability social protection, which is social protection that, that uh, provides life skills and um, long-term uh, capabilities that young people need as they move from transition from ch childhood to adolescence and later on adulthood. And all of these are underlined by a very rigorous policy and legal framework that is necessary to make social protection happen. So with this um, conceptual framework in mind, we looked at the literature on what were some known risk and potential factors on uh, protective factors for non-adherence and HIV-related outcomes. And the literature on this is perhaps not surprising. You'll see um, seven key factors listed here. But what is telling is that HIV-positive children and adolescents are as vulnerable as others uh, in this age group, but they have an, a host of additional HIV-related factors that make them additionally vulnerable. For example, um, disclosure, whether at the clinic or the home setting, really shapes how they're able to take their medication or engage with, uh, in, in relationships, whether romantic, sexual, or um, friendships. Um, HIV-related stigma really shapes um, these outcomes as well, as does transitioning in different levels of care from pediatric to youth to adult care. So just quickly, what did we find? We, we identified a, a lot of different studies from a quantitative and qualitative perspective in the literature review, and they were in, uh, we could group them into two levels. There were national level studies that looked at, say, South Africa's or Kenya's um, OVC or social cash transfers. And then there were studies that uh, were more randomized control trials or longitudinal analysis that tried to look at if accessing a certain set of social protection made a difference. And this table just summarizes the types of social protection that we found. And you can see that there is a broad, there's broad variety in what is available out there. So if you look on the left -hand side of the table, you can see that, that single types of social protection, whether cash or care, were available in quite a few different countries, Burkina Faso, Kenya, Malawi, South Africa and all, you know, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, but then combinations were increasing, increasingly becoming available. So you can see uh, that there's quite a few cash plus care um, interventions that have been tested or offered um, in quite a few countries, as well as care and capabilities. And in only two, but I think they hold a lot of promise, studies that look at combinations of cash plus capability. This was a study of training, uh, livelihood training, and also um, small grants. And those who combine all three kinds of intervention. And of course, we know that a lot of countries have made great progress and are really leading when it comes to having in place the legal framework for social protection, which is known as the transformative social protection. And as you can see from the list there, almost all the countries in, the, in Eastern and Southern Africa had at least one social protection policy in place or under development. Though, as we know, this does not mean that social protection is reaching all those that it could. In terms of summarizing the findings of, of these different studies that were, were put in that table, we found that there is that social protection does seem to work. There is strong evidence for HIV prevention from multiple studies in multiple countries. There is growing evidence for ART adherence qualitatively and uh, most recently quantitatively. But we need to understand a bit uh, better what are uh, the types and combinations of cash transfers that improve adolescent adherence specifically or help with HIV specific outcomes. And just to give you a quick example on how the cash transfers may work, this is uh, work from Professor Lucy Kluver at the um, University of Oxford and Cape Town, which looked at how accessing social uh, child grant uh, over a two-year period was linked to reduced um, transactional sex and age disparate sex incidents among adolescent girls in South Africa. This is really uh, visually shows how on the gray bars you can see the, those adolescent girls who are not able to access grants and in the blue bars much lower you can see um, adolescent girls who were able to access the grants. They did not um, initiate these high-risk behaviors a year after. So it really speaks to the power of accessing child support grants but also accessing them in continuity. So this is those young women who access them over uh, both at the baseline and follow-up of this study. And this really got us thinking, but 
cash transfers are, are really important, but combinations um, are clearly better. And as one of our expert consultations put it, the importance of deliberate, politically backed and sustainable combinations of child sensitive social protection mechanisms cannot be overstated. So our team, um, and again, Professor Lucy Kluber has led a lot of the work here, started looking at the data from the Mzanzi Waka study to see what was making a difference. And this is uh, recent findings that were just uh, presented at um, IAS and also in a paper in AIDS care for those who would like to review them in more detail. But to just summarize this graph, if you look at it on the left hand side, 54% of the HIV positive adolescents in our sample reported past week non-adherence if they did not access any kind of social protection. However, when they accessed one or two or even better three types of social protection, three different uh, provisions of social protection, there, uh, these rates of non-adherence went down to 18%. And specifically in this, in this sample, the, the social protection provisions that made a difference were accessing an HIV support group, having good food security, and having good parental monitoring. So communicating with your parent about where you would go and, and knowing where your parent was. And we did similar analysis with regards to unprotected sex. We know that um, in this population of young people, we are trying to both ensure that they stay alive, but that also that they lead fulfilling and healthy lives into adulthood. And um, engaging uh, and accessing proper sexual and productive health services is key to that. And we found that three social protection provisions were key to reduce the unprotected sex in the same sample. So good parental monitoring and supervision, accessing schools, and receiving adolescent sensitive clinic care. And again, this slide um, exemplifies how single provisions are great, but combinations of provisions are even better. And you can see that this effect is even stronger among girl, amongst the girls in the sample. So the, in light gray, it's the full sample, and unprotected sex rates reduced from 22% to 4%, and amongst HIV-positive adolescent girls, the rates of unprotected sex went down from 49% to 9% with combinations of interventions. Leslie and I have spent a lot of time thinking about what this means, and also about how to translate the feedback that our experts gave us into data analysis. So this slide is some very preliminary research where we try to understand better what is happening with care. There was a lot of talk for those of you who were at Sekeba and AIDS about not forgetting the carers, not assuming that care should be provided and is provided um, easily, but that it, has a, it plays a crucial role in adolescent and child health and well-being. So this slide, we just looked at combinations of care, and we see that uh, care seems to make a huge difference for adolescent girls and whether they engage in protective sexual practices. So in green, you can see that 56% of, of the adolescent girls engaged in safe sex, but if they received combinations of care, it went up to 93%, which is amazing. The way we, we think about how this is working is really was put perfectly by um, Lynette um, Mudekunya from REPSI. And when she said, and I'm going to just quickly read the sentence because I think it's very powerful um, in the next slide, the critical outcome of psychosocial support is resilience. Resilience is the ability to get up when life has knocked you down and still stand up and keep going. If you can imagine a child with enough people around them, enough hands reaching them, that in fact they never fall all the way to the ground. Thank you, Alona. Um, so as we spoke with experts from um, many different organizations, um, many different places, um, both in the Eastern Cape where Mzanzi Wako is conducted, as well as international experts and adolescents themselves, um, what came out repeatedly was that beyond cash, there are other forms of social protection that require an uh, uh, acknowledgement. So one expert said that the acknowledgement of care and support must be more explicit. And here what he was talking about is that oftentimes there are interventions that are social protection, that many definitions do capture as social protection, but we might not see it as such because oftentimes we perceive social uh, protection as to be cash-based. Um, so the re recommendation there was to really continue um, to consider care and support, which is what some of Alona's analysis has been doing. Um, Another expert spoke about looking at the whole package. Um, so this speaks to the importance of combinations. 
like Alona's slide showed, um, there are different factors on many different levels, psycho, social, social, and economic, um, as well as clinic that might be important. So for example, you might have treatment at um, the point of delivery, but you might also have other things like transportation costs and travel costs. And some work done um, by Pediatric AIDS Treatment for Africa has also um, borne this out. So in terms of care and capability, we've been really trying to think about, so how do these work and why do these work the way that they do? And we've conceptualized care as having an impact in three interrelated but distinct ways. The first is um, having benefits um, as standalones, so by itself, or like Alona showed in combinations with other types of care, social protection, or other types of non-care social protection, like cash or capability, for example. Um, we're also conceptualizing it as a flexible mechanism so that it can actually buffer and respond to different needs. Because care is provided by people, those people might be able to support and provide a buffer so that social protect other forms of social protection uh, can work, that adolescents or children can be referred. And third is care might act as glue for other forms of social protection. So the quote on the right-hand side I think really illustrates this nicely. The expert said that social protection might provide cash, but if families aren't cognizant of other needs that children have, the cash might not have as much of an impact. Children must feel loved, cared for, and belonging. And this is just one example of the ways that cash, when included with other forms of so care social protection, can kind of be glued together for greater impact. Alona mentioned earlier as well um, this newer conceptualization of capability interventions. So as adolescents or children are going through their lives and getting ready to be in the world um, in a different way as adults, um, transferring skills and knowledge, a knowledge that could help them uh, address structural inequalities that they might face later down the line could really help. So in terms of the key messages that we've been taking um, from this, from all of these different methods and these different experts and what we're seeing in the Mzanzi Wako data, is that first, context matters. So uh, we've showed a few examples of different types of social protection that work um, in the context in which um, they are happening. But we know that different countries can have very different contexts. And even within a country, uh, there can be very, very different contexts based on geography um, as well as other factors. So there aren't any real silver bullets. Um, social protection might need to look different based on where, where it's needed and where it's based. Another important factor is age. So when we were first looking at it, there are definitions for child-sensitive social protection, but adolescence is an area that often doesn't get as much attention, and adolescents and children might have very different requirements. A child under five who's relying on their caregiver for everything might have very different needs than an adolescent who might be attending the clinic by themselves. Um, last, flexibility um, in terms of mechanisms was something that was borne out very strongly by the expert consultations. And I think the quote on the left-hand side demonstrates that well. The expert said that social protection should be dynamic to adopt to evolving needs that children might have. The stagnant nature of some social protection mechanisms mean that they can't adopt to the needs of young people as they go through adolescence. So that speaks to both uh, the need for flexibility and also talks about age considerations. So as you'll see on the next slide, um, other important messages that came out of this report were that good targeting or means-tested provisions are needed. So that means we need to make sure that the social protection is reaching the people who need it. Additionally, uh, sustainable national programs are crucial. What came out um, from expert consultations, again, very strongly, was that sometimes what will happen is a social protection mechanism might be implemented by a non-governmental organization. And then when that is removed or it collapses, the adolescent or child might be left more vulnerable. So the importance of sustainability and national leadership in these programs are crucial to the long-term uh, success. Last, uh, transition is something that's very important that requires more attention. Oftentimes, adolescents or children, when they're trans transitioning to adolescent care, get lost to follow up. One expert described tra the transition process of akin to jumping off of a cliff, because it can be so difficult sometimes uh, for that period. So social protection that really considers the needs of children and adolescents as they transition is important. 
So often when we talk about social protection, one of the questions that we get is, well, that all sounds great, but is the provision of this social protection for children and adolescents really feasible? And luckily, there's some evidence, um, some displayed here by the World Bank, that says that, yes, it actually is, that well-designed social protection mechanisms are actually quite cost-effective. Um, one World Bank study said between 1.5 and 1.9 percent of GDP. Also, many African states, as was shown in the earlier map, do already have long-established histories of social protection. And even if there, it requires an input, there are also cost-saving mechanisms to ensuring that a population is healthy and well-educated in the future. Last, co-financing by multiple departments can make this easy. So I think this quote at the end really summarizes it nicely. If we want to reach everyone that has not been tested, if we want to get 90% on treatment, and if we want to end AIDS by 2030, we all have to collaborate. Not one sector by itself is going to achieve this. And I think when we look at that, we can look at that both internally, so co-financing within countries with multiple departments, as well as uh, a broader look at collaboration. So what are the barriers to achieving effective social protection initiatives? One of the main barriers is social and political attitudes among actors as well as citizens. So I don't think anyone would dispute that children are a group that's highly vulnerable and in need of social protection, but sometimes when those children become adolescents, they're not considered as deserving of support. Um, as mentioned earlier, the transient nature of some donor-led social protection schemes might make uh, children or adolescents more vulnerable when, they, when they're withdrawn or when they fold. And there are also sometimes discrepancies between the policy provisions and implementation. So to have something on paper is great, um, but beyond paper, it needs to be implemented and implemented well, and sometimes there are barriers to doing that. So what's next? In terms of future directions of research and programming, one of, um, one of the next frontiers that um, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Hodes and Professor Kluver uh, borrowed in a recent paper was the need to combine social protection with biomedical programs like PrEP and medical male circumcision. Also, future research is needed to look at different populations. Um, adolescents and children are a vulnerable population in themselves, but within that, there are subpopulations, such as sexual minorities, that might also be additionally vulnerable. There's been um, more work on adolescent and child femininities, um, so greater work on the other side of the binary on adolescent masculinities has also been recommended, and last, prevention for positives. So in looking at these directions for future research, um, it's great that research um, can identify the most cost-effective combinations. Oftentimes, as this, as this expert quote shows, we live in a world where technologies drive policy rather than the other way around. So in conclusion, um, sustainable, age-appropriate, and context-specific social protection is an important tool, and evidence does show that it can have um, a positive impact on reducing HIV transmission as well as uh, adolescent adherence to ART. Uh, combinations of social protection, and more specifically cash and care, are more effective than single mechanisms. And then there are other um, mechanisms in the care and capability criteria that are promising and require greater attention. Last, social protection um, may be feasible and may be a cost-effective way for national governments to improve HIV-related outcomes, and this merits greater attention. So last, none of this would be possible without the incredible team um, that makes this, that, that runs this study, as well as uh, the teenagers and the key informants who take part, and our wonderful funders. Um, so thank you very much, and we'll look forward to answering any questions at the end. Thank you very much, Leslie and uh, Ilona. A very interesting perspective in terms of bringing together the evidence which has already been established by experts. But what we are going to do now is, uh, before we actually have the questions, I am going to ask Dr. Nongo. I understand you are with the African Platform for Social Protection, and I would really love to hear from you, your perspectives and comments around this research and how you think we can actually best put these research findings 
into practical action. That is really an issue of converting this evidence into something which we can use on the ground or I would really want to hear your perspectives on this because we are in this area of practice. So Dr. Nongo, can we have your views on the presentation? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, who have prevent, uh, presented an excellent presentation. Um, I do have a few slides, although I think I will run through some of them very quickly because I think uh, the, the, the earlier presentations have really done a good job and they have covered some of the things I would have said. I think uh, I, I would like to sort of comment more uh, towards the end of my presentation uh, 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 about sort of the recommendations and the options that we probably uh, can take. Uh, firstly, the, to look at the issue of uh, what social protection is, there is quite a lot of confusion uh, across our continent on exactly what social protection is. There are so many definitions that are flying around, uh, some of them advanced by our development partners, uh, and some of them by UN agencies and so on. But actually I think two definitions uh, which are very relevant for the continent come from the African Union uh, and the SADAC. In these two definitions they clearly state that social protection is a function of two concepts which are essentially social security uh, and social services. That definition is important, particularly for this discussion, because we are looking at, at uh, uh, um, how to holistically address uh, the needs of our adolescent children. So if you look at the social protection from a narrow perspective, you might actually miss uh, the value of what social protection can actually do. Um, Social protection, uh, you know, has been around and uh, certain countries have, have been working on it for quite a long time. In southern and uh, eastern African countries, we do have social protection programs, some of which started quite a long time ago. Botswana, for instance, started with intro, uh, uh, contributory uh, social protection schemes in 1889 followed by South Africa 1928, you can see uh, that part of Southern Africa. Uganda, for instance, started their contributory schemes in 1921. So the sorts of contributory uh, uh, social protection schemes did not, uh, you know, are certainly not new. But the challenge with those ones is that the coverage is very small, uh, ranging between 5 to 10 percent uh, across the two regions, Southern and, and Eastern African countries, and largely the agricultural, domestic and other informal sectors are still not covered uh, uh, by those provisions. Um, you know, we, we also have non-contributory uh, social protection schemes, and these are the ones that people usually refer to as, as social assistance programs. Um, if we had time, we would have really gone into, into you know, sort of defining uh, this social tra transfer, uh, social protection program. But Southern Africa is certainly the leader in terms of providing these, these uh, uh, social assistance programs, uh, particularly those that are uh, given to specific groups, the older persons, children, and so on and so forth. South Africa as a country uh, it is quite huge. In fact, South Africa ranks number five in the world in terms of pro in, in terms of providing uh, certain grants. It, 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 the child grants, for instance, is one of the examples uh, which which South Africa ranks number five in the whole world. So Southern Africa is really doing well in in respect of uh, those provisions. But we also have other provisions across uh, all the countries. Uh, some of them are pilots, reaching fairly large numbers of people. Some of them are being turned into national programs, such as in Rwanda and, and in Kenya. Uh, and this focus on, on a number of target groups, uh, older persons, uh, vulnerable children, and so on and so forth. Um, the region is also running a lot of pilot programs 
uh, I have a problem with pilot programs myself because I believe that they must graduate into national programs. There is no value in continuing to run uh, pilot programs. One good example uh, is, is, is the Sudan, which has turned a traditional social protection provision in the form of the zakat into a national uh, social pro uh, protection provision. I think we can learn from Sudan so that the other countries uh, such as in Southern Africa which are implementing things like Zundera Mambo and others can also turn those uh, into, into national programs. Um, the issue of child sensitive social protection is absolutely, cri uh, absolutely critical when we are looking at, at uh, the needs of, of children in general and adolescents uh, uh, in particular. Uh, adolescents, you know, the challenge is that they are at a risk of being left out uh, of, uh, of certain programs and their, their needs are not adequately covered. Uh, the, pre the, the, the previous presenters have, have really captured this issue very well. Issues not uh, considered, gaps not covered, and, and, and cohorts uh, of adolescents as a population groups uh, left out. Child sensitive social protection then can, can actually help to avoid the negative impacts of, of, uh, of, of the, the, the provisions that we make uh, for children can also consider the issues of age and gender, which the previous uh, presenters have, have actually uh, you know, talked about. Um, looking at the, the children's needs through the, throughout the life cycle. I mean, taking this life cycle approach uh, in terms of making the provisions. Uh, voices of children uh, uh, are also some of the things that child-sensitive social protection can, can actually uh, take care of. I think the most important thing is that social protection programs must look at the, the, the must have a lens of the needs of children throughout their life cycle, through the design uh, stages, throughout the implementation, and looking at a holistic and comprehensive nature uh, in their provision. Um, we know that social protection has quite a lot of impacts. Um, again, our colleagues that have just presented have focused on that quite quite adequately. Very good outcomes in education, extremely good outcomes in health, in food, and in child development. Social protection we know is quite capable uh, uh, of, of producing those positive uh, uh, positive outcomes. Um, so uh, Yes, so, so I really believe that uh, a social protection is, is a very useful mechanism to help us support our children. However, turning on to some of uh, you know, the recommendations, uh, um, uh, a number of, of countries across the, 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 the two regions, Eastern and Southern African region, already have developed uh, policies, uh, some of them national, others small uh, in nature, uh, but these, these actually provide a guide on how we can develop social protection uh, programs. I will not call on the development of more policies. I think that that may not really add value uh, to the lives of children. I think the recommendation is that in programs that we develop must now uh, deliberate the adolescents. I would also call for a, for a review of a, a existing programs so that we look at this and see where we can actually begin to look uh, at the needs of, of the ad, ad, adolescents. Case transfer programs are usually developed uh, for certain cohorts of children. Children is, I think, the presenters looked at the issue of, of, um, of the rigidity of some of the programs that are provided. 
the issue is, you know, they focus on certain age groups and they are looking at certain uh, purposes. For instance, they may be looking at the under fives or probably looking only at the people, uh, uh, children with uh, living with HIV AIDS and so on, or primary school age uh, uh, going children. But there is always a gap when certain groups of children are then left out. Um, if you are take, looking at children only going uh, into primary school, what happens when they transition into going into secondary school? If you are only looking at those uh, uh, from 0 to 5, what happens when they turn 6? If you are only looking at, at uh, those that are probably going into secondary school, what happens when they turn 18? Uh, are you going to abandon them? So we, we have this issue where our children are, are left out completely in limbo and this is a situation where they fall into really uh, unuseful uh, 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 consequences. Adolescents are not the ones that analyze con conflicts in Somalia, in in, 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 in Sudan, in, in you know, northern Uganda and so on, children are recruited uh, into fighting uh, uh, along adults. And, and social protection can actually prevent uh, our kids uh, you know, from being recruited into, into, those, uh, into those unfortunate uh, circumstances. Uh, the issue of graduation uh, which is the next uh, slide, is, 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 a, is a topical issue at the moment. Uh, we, we must, case transfer programs particularly must have an element of graduation so people have to move uh, out of the program so that other, others can enter. When you are looking at children, my argument is that there are certain groups of people that cannot graduate and, and essentially I believe that children should not really be considered uh, into those, those arguments of graduation uh, because as soon as you graduate uh, uh, you must be careful that you do not leave our children uh, 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 without any sort of support. Um, and I have already talked about the issue of children in school, primary school or secondary school and so on. The situation essentially leaves uh, kids completely exposed. Um, the recognition is that, you know, holistic programs, uh, that's my next uh, slide, um, holistic programs uh, that provide the basics as well as psychosocial needs of children should be considered. Um, it is not enough to just provide uh, the element of money. Uh, I really like uh, the, the programs that we have, for instance, in South Africa, uh, which, are, which are giving all sorts of grants to children as well as uh, those that are providing care to the children. That provision of money alone is not enough because you can actually them to danger through people who go out recruiting children to take care of, but all they are interested in really is the money uh, and not the love of the children. So that has to be accompanied by a, you know, a lot of other services around that. Um, I, I think we, we need a comprehensive and holistic a, a, a provision of services. Cash alone can in fact uh, be dangerous uh, to our children. Finally, governments continue to talk about the issue of, of affordability. The affordability debate has been around uh, uh, with us for a while. Uh, governments will tell you that we cannot uh, provide adequately for social protection because we do not have the money. I am hearing that argument more and more because uh, uh, there is there is a there is a really a, a crisis in a lot of countries. The economies are not doing well, and so on. I do not buy that argument for a single moment. It is about political will. It is about commitment. 
uh, because we have very poor countries that have uh, proceeded, proceeded to provide excellent social protection services uh, to their citizens. I mean, Lesotho is an example. It established an older person's uh, uh, transfer in 2004. Uh, and, and six years down the line, it is still managing to support uh, that program from their own money without any support from donors. Uh, Zanzibar uh, has just recently introduced a program, uh, you know, a, a provision for older persons. Um, again, they are using their own money. So I do not believe that uh, in the absence of uh, uh, rather, I do not believe that if there is, there, is, there is commitment, governments in Africa will fail to provide for all, uh, 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 you know, their citizens. I think we must ensure and call upon our governments to put in resources to support our children. Our children are the future, uh, and I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nongo. That's a very interesting response as well. Now, before we open up for questions, I am going to just attempt to give a summary of some of the key issues I heard from the presentation and um, the response by Dr. Nongo. But I want to be very honest that is not the easiest of tasks to do because we have had very interesting issues which came up. Now, from the first presentation which we listened to, I will say the key issue which I got is that when we talk of social protection, issues of combinations are critical. That is to say, you cannot say we are giving cash either to children or to a vulnerable group, then it should be sufficient. What is coming out from the evidence is that you need to combine these instruments in order to achieve the desired results. So the issue of combinations. And two, there is a danger that when people hear about social protection, they want to think of maybe social cash transfers or cash and forget issues of psychosocial support. So we need to be making sure that whenever we approach this subject, we drive the issue that it is not only cash alone, but issues of other necessary services which children require. Uh, the other issue which I found very interesting personally is the issue of when you are thinking of social protection, we need a very thorough review of the context within which we want to implement this particular instru instrument. Because if you look at what is happening currently, because of the interest in social protection, particularly cash transfers, we think it can be done everywhere and we don't have a thorough analysis of the context. And from the first presentation, this came out very clearly. Issues of age and flexibility, one way or another we are trying to you know, grapple with that, but it is also critical. Now, the other issue which I got from the last presentation, I will just really focus on what I think is issues. The key issue which again came out from Dr. Nongo is that money alone is not enough. And I think this is very interesting. He has also touched on one of those sensitive issues when it comes to our government in Eastern and Southern Africa, the issues of affordability. This is what comes out to the forefront most usually when you engage them on issues of social protection. But whether that is true or not, that is what we want to hear from the discussion. Now, out of the response by Dr. Nongo, I found it also very interesting that the issue of what constitutes social protection still remains a big challenge within the region. It is understood differently, and people can take it to mean different things and apply it to different issues as well. And he has tried to give us a guide which can be valuable in the region a guide which is from the African Union and SADC definition of social protection. Probably that can assist us. He has also touched on one of those issues, you know, which also creates problems. Issues of social security versus social assistance. 
I think it's something which we need to reflect on because usually when you talk particularly to our experts and the bureaucrats in government, this issue of social security and social assistance, sometimes there is a mix on the issues and we want to be very careful when we approach this subject. Probably it can be one of those issues which we take seriously when we talk about uh, issues of advocacy work to make sure that the two instruments are understood clearly. And from the last presentation, there was also an issue of the graduation and exit strategies. It's a very topical issue, and it's an issue which we are all grappling with, and it's an issue which we need to be thinking about as we, we go along. I would want to, to really take these just as the highlights of the issues which came out of the presentation. And uh, what we are going to do now, I can see we are now left with 10 minutes to end our discussion. So I will close my talk on the highlight of the presentations and open this issue to questions. Now, I, I want some assistance here because I am not on the same platform with you. There are a few questions which have come through and I'm sure people who are part of this discussion have questions to ask. So can I ask specifically to the RIAD colleagues who are facilitating this to guide us on how best we are going to approach these questions. They have been emailed to me and I hope everybody is seeing the questions. Am I right to, to say that the people who did the presentations are seeing these questions from the participants? Hello. Uh, I I can't see any, I'm not seeing them. You are not seeing them, okay. No, I can't see the questions. Is Angelita online? Please read the questions, Mr. Che, and then direct them. Ah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So what I will do is I will just read the questions because I have them in front of me here. The first question is coming from Malawi. It's saying that defining social protection is crucial if we look country by country. In Malawi, for example, we have social protection, but a clear definition is key. My understanding on this is they are acknowledging what the presenters actually spoke about in terms of what really is social protection. And to the second question is the what can we do at country level to make our government see the need to provide grants as in South Africa? The third question is, I would like to ask Dr. Nongo to what extent are governments investing in care and capabilities aspect and national social protection plans and not only cash transfer. This is coming from Stuart. These are the, the three questions which have been posed to the presenters. So can we have responses? Dr. Nungo, Leslie and Gittings, did you get the questions? Yes, I got, uh, I got, um, so, so can you just come, come, come with the last one? The last one is what can governments do uh, I didn't okay, get the last me, part. Okay, let, let me read it out again. I would like to ask Dr. Nongo, to what extent are governments investing in care and capabilities aspects and national social protection plans and not only cash transfers? Did you get the question? Yes, yes, I got it. Okay. Actually, can I start with that one? Yeah, sure, sure. All right. So, uh, um, so t to what extent? I mean, I think I think that uh, we have made quite a lot of progress uh, since, for instance, since the Livingston Conference in two thousand and six. Uh, our governments have really tried to put in in place some measures to accelerate the provision of social protection. Uh, programs uh, in the region. Um, if you if you if you analyze the trend, governments uh, during that time have come up with policies uh, on social protection. 
uh, other governments have actually gone ahead to develop pieces of legislation uh, on social protections. So we now have, for instance, in Kenya, a, a Social Assistance Act, which, which was uh, also uh, uh, put in place in 2015. Um, so, so countries are making a bit of an effort. However, I think there is uh, still a bit of confusion uh, uh, within our countries, and this is why I raise the issue of, as Africa, we need to understand and know what social protection is, uh, so that we know how to handle uh, the whole spectrum of social protection. If you visit certain countries now, uh, and you ask what social protection is, for those that think they know, they will only tell you about cash transfer programs. You listen to government presentations in some cases, all they will tell you are cash transfer programs. Now, I think it's important for us to realize that cash transfers are only a very tiny component of the spectrum of social protection. So consequently, you find governments that are now only investing in the so-called cash transfers and leaving out elements uh, that will actually make social protection whole. So they leave out the issues of care, they leave out you know, the, the, the other welfare-related aspects of social protection. Uh, I think we have a gap in that respect. And, and I think it is absolutely important for us to begin to, to preach uh, the gospel that social protection is, 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 is comprehensive. We need to approach it more comprehensively. Looking at only cash transfers is only a piecemeal uh, 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 you know, address, addressing of the whole issue uh, of social protection. So that would be my answer to, to the last um, to the last question. Going on to uh, uh, question number two, what can countries do to begin to provide the same sort of provisions uh, that we find in, in South Africa? My response would, would be that I think we, we, we need to see a lot more commitment uh, from, from countries, a lot of political commitment uh, for, for governments uh, to support uh, their citizens. I have to quickly you know, bring in a bit of a proviso here. We are not asking countries to, to provide uh, uh, these provisions at the same level as South Africa or indeed at the same level as the, as the other countries. Each country has its own context. It's, uh, each country you know, has its own priorities, uh, each country has its own challenges, uh, but I think the progress we want to see is, is, is um, you know, an effort by countries to begin to increasingly put uh, their own budgets into social protection uh, programs. Uh, there is no country that will, or, or rather there is no program that will be sustainable if it is funded by donors. Donors can come and support us up to, set a, to a certain extent, but sustainability will come into governments putting their own money into the, into the provisions of, of, of those countries. It comes out of governments owning up to their challenges and owning up to their responsibilities of providing for their citizens. So I think it is possible. I think our governments can increasingly provide uh, services up to the levels of South Africa. They have to start somewhere. They have to start small. And I, I, can, I believe that with time, they will provide almost the same provisions as, as we are finding you know, in South Africa and indeed other countries, such as Mauritius, uh, Namibia, and others. Uh, the other question uh, from Malawi, uh, was about uh, the definition of social protection. Uh, I thought it was a comment more than a question, but I, I really would agree. Uh, social protection, uh, if we would like to understand it in a very simple way, is simply an equation uh, that goes uh, something like this. Social protection equals 
social security plus social services where social security equals social insurance these are the contributory schemes uh, the pensions the medical schemes and so on to which individuals make a contribution that social insurance then you have social allowances these are state funded programs but which are not means tested and then social assistance are programs which are funded by the state but which are means tested these days you will find people collapsing social allowances and social assistance into one so when you see literature uh, which is simply referring to social assistance you will find that within that there are means tested programs as well as non means tested uh, programs social services on the other hand relates to education water food etc etc or others that may be defined by the by the state thank you thank you dr nongo I Leslie and Ilona, are you still online? We are, yes. We are. Thank you for that very thoughtful response to Dr. Nango. We've been nodding all along. Um, we'll take maybe the last two questions because we realize time is also short. Um, and the questions are um, about how we can increase and improve global advocacy efforts to make sure that large donors know more about psychosocial support and extending cash into the cash plus. Um, combinations that we've all been agreeing are, are crucial and the second question is very similar which is how do we um, advocate for broader comprehensive care and support services and I suppose the, the simple answer is that this webinar is part of such efforts and uh, Leslie and I and I know everyone who is involved in organizing and participating in these uh, have been involved in similar efforts at the global level we've presented these findings um, at a UNAID social protection working group um, us or different team members. So we're trying to get uh, to increase sort of the, the noise, uh, the good noise, the concerted efforts around this topic. And certainly um, at the recent conferences people have presented findings that can be used to sort of promote um, evidence uh, to promote these, uh, these decisions. When it comes to care it is a bit more complicated because what we're really saying and Leslie mentioned this when she talked about flexibility and care as the glue that holds things together, care is beneficial, is beneficial in part because it is so flexible and in part because it is a bit harder to define but it is being provided in real life settings so what we need to think about is supporting caregivers so that they can do it, uh, in particular older caregivers and what is making life easier or harder for grandparents who are taking care of children and adolescents who are vulnerable. So that's one area that um, will have, could have direct effect in how young people are accessing social protection. And then in thinking about um, are there specific, uh, more community defined, so different communities defining their own needs, what are the care needs of, of a specific community would be different from another one, so how can we build up skills and and perhaps processes through which communities can say well in our in our schools we need additional disclosure support for HIV positive adolescents but in other settings we need more HIV support groups at the clinics so differentiating um, what types of care are available in different communities and uh, accepting and acknowledging that that is how it should work rather than come in with with a blanket list of, of provisions that should be offered to everyone and Dr. Nongo also spoke to this. I think one area that we need to think more about is how to measure the reach of care and it's a relatively easy to, to set up a national level program of cash transfers. I know it's a huge effort but if we think about the logistics of measuring, rolling out and, and reach, it is relatively easier to, to quantify how many people are accessing uh, a certain grant or an in-kind transfer, it, it does become a bit harder to measure and to quantify progress um, when it comes to care provisions and perhaps capability training and support for young people. So that's an area that we need to think a bit more about and, and hopefully we'll have answers soon. And just to add Thank briefly to, to what Alona was saying um, on the care provisions. Um, like she demonstrated in, in some of the graphs as well, a lot of the care provisions are things that are already happening um, in areas. 
um, that, that can be leveraged. So it's not something that necessarily needs to come in from outside. It's also about finding things that can already, that are already working and leveraging them internally, as well as asking what else is needed within that space. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, I would just want to close this by, you know, raising some, one of the things which came out from the presentation. I think it was by Leslie and Elona. The, the issue of these perceptions and uh, political attitudes uh, as one of those things constituting a barrier to social protection. For me, the issue really was the, the, these perceptions and attitudes or political inclinations, are they the same towards all the different social protection instruments or they are specific to certain social protection instruments? I think it's one of those issues which needs something like further investigation because we know you, you deliver social protection through different instruments. But my, my only reading is that, uh, you know, you, you seem to have a lot of these perceptions and political attitudes when it comes to the issue particularly of cash, social cash transfers. And I think when Dr. Nongo was speaking, he touched on this issue, on the issue of affordability. So I think it's one issue which we need to think about. And the issue of these exit and graduation strategies. I think if we can have, you know, a closer analysis and look into that, it may really help us in terms of how all these things we are talking about are going to assist our different countries. Now, let me just thank the panelists who took their time to really prepare and make the presentations, particularly Leslie Gittings and Ilona Tosca and Dr. Nongo with the African Social Protection Platform. I really want to, to thank you for taking your time and making these presentations to us. I also want to thank our Riyadh Secretariat staff for all the logistics which went into this. It was really massive because I know on my side we started about five days ago to make sure that we have logistics in place and this is going to run smoothly. I also want to take this opportunity to actually thank our sponsors for the support they are giving so that we are able to sit and discuss these issues, particularly Sweden and NORAD, I really appreciate. And I also want to, to thank our panelists from Zanziwako. This was really great. I hope we should be able to take this forward, because this is only the first from what I am informed. Now, if, if you happen to have missed any part of the discussion, my understanding is that this whole process was recorded, so you will be able to switch it on and listen to what we have been discussing. And if you still have issues coming out, please feel free to share this with our secretariat at Riyadh. You can do this through their website, or you can also follow the work they are doing on Twitter. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. OK.